Hallelujah, hallelujah. It's so good to be with you here today. For those of you who don't know me, I am Pastor Tyler Moore. It is my pleasure to be with you on this beautiful Easter Sunday, whether here in person or online. Thank you so much for joining us. Make sure if you're watching online to share that service if you're watching live via Facebook. A special welcome to our guests today. It is so nice to have you here. Uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, just so you know, as you kind of go through this particular service, you received a bulletin as you came in. All of the songs, the hymns will be in that hymnal, that red book there in front of you, uh, and it'll be corresponding to the number. We'll try and let you know what page number there is. So that'll kind of be how you track along with that. There are also some yellow cards in the front of, or the back of the pew in front of you. Uh, that is just, if we would ask you to fill out your name, maybe a little contact information. We're not going to sell it or anything. We're just going to send you a note of thanks for joining us. You can drop it in the little box there at the end of the service. And if you are a member here, again, welcome to you. You can fill out one of those white cards. Those are the cards for you. Uh, we got a lot of things going on this morning. After this service, we have our pancake breakfast that Pastor Moreno, he's going to leave uh, right before the sermon because he didn't want to hear me talk today. I don't know, it's the weirdest thing. No, he, he's going to go over there. He's been uh, working hard on that, so he'll be going over to check on that in the middle of the service, but that is happening right after the service. And then we also have an Easter egg hunt starting at 10 o'clock. I don't know if there's an age limit uh, for that Easter egg hunt, you know, getting out there, throwing some elbows, taking those candy. That's, I don't know how that works. Uh, we also, again, a lot of things going on. Uh, starting next week, looking at next Saturday, uh, Family Point Ministries, which is the ministry right here in our back parking lot, they have a market happening uh, between our parking lot and the St. Thomas parking lot. Uh, it's kind of a community neighborhood market, so it's a great time to come. That's between 10 and 2 next Saturday. And then Family Point's actually going to be here next Sunday. Uh, they're going to share a little bit about their ministry, about what they do in the community and with the community. Uh, we'll also have a little breakfast for them in between services. So a lot of things happening here. Uh, and I would encourage you, find a way to get involved here at church, but also in the community, right? Because we are meant to be a community organization spreading hope, spreading love. Uh, and that's, that's our calling. Those are all the things that I wrote down here on this sheet. I'm sure I forgot some things. Um, so I would encourage you to look through your bulletin, find something that connects with you. With that said, let's celebrate Easter. Let's stand as we sing our processional hymn together.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Today we have gathered in God's house to worship our risen Lord Jesus Christ. But before we do, we must first approach God's throne of mercy, confessing our sin which prevents us from entering into God's holy presence by the power and guidance of the Holy Spirit whom Jesus promised after his resurrection to send to us. Let us lay all our sins before the cross of Jesus. Let us take time to reflect and confess. Almighty and most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in our thoughts, words, and actions. We have not lived our lives in ways that have honored you and shown respect for others. We deserve the punishment Jesus bore on the cross for us, but we pray that for his sake you will be merciful to us and will forgive us of all our sins which have separated us from you. Dear friends, Jesus has borne all our sins in his own body on the cross so that we might be forgiven for them and through the Holy Spirit live new lives through faith in Jesus. As you have sincerely confessed your sins, know that for Jesus' sake, God forgives you. As his servant, I announce to you that your sins are hereby forgiven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We, we have, have been forgiven. forgiven. We, we have, have been restored, restored to new life in Christ. Christ. Alleluia. Alleluia. Alleluia, for Christ is risen. He, he is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Alleluia. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Slain, whose blood set 
together, let us pray. Almighty God the Father, through your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, you have overcome death and opened the gate of everlasting life to us. Grant that we who celebrate with joy the day of our Lord's resurrection may be raised from the death of sin by your life-giving spirit. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. First reading this morning is from Isaiah chapter 25, verses 6 through 9. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, a rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord we have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. The epistle reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 11, and can be found on page 961 of your pew Bible. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Forth now in life. 
Please rise for the gospel. Our gospel reading comes from the 16th chapter of the gospel according to St. Mark. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so they might go and anoint him. And very early on, the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us (sighs) from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe. And they were alarmed. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb. For trembling and astonishment had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. This is the gospel of our Lord. Together as the people of God, we join together in proclaiming our faith in Father, Son, and the Spirit with the words of the Nicene Creed found on page 158 of your hymnal. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who is spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. The kids are welcome to come up for a short message. So, um, Zach, though, you should probably stay in your, your pew. I know. It's, it's okay. All right. Gotcha. So, yeah. But the kids are welcome to come up.
from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I want to start off with a little joke. It has nothing to do with the sermon, but you know, we're all in our, our shirt and tie, so I figured we're going to loosen up a little bit. So uh, what do you call a group of rabbits, bunnies, if you will, side by side, standing shoulder to shoulder, walking backwards? A receding hairline. <laughs> I'm allowed to tell that joke. All right. <clears throat> that has absolutely nothing to do with the message, but I figure I'd loosen you up a little bit, you know? Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. 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 You know, as I look back over Holy Week, it's such a fascinating story. Uh, kind of the culmination of the ministry and life of Jesus of Nazareth, who all historians agree was a real person who did remarkable things and grew this great following. In the last seven days of his life on this earth, or at least his life before he came back, were just full of these interesting paradoxes. It's almost a study in contrasts, a study in differences, because we have uh, the triumphal entry as they shout Hosanna all the way to the court of Pilate where they're shouting crucify him. You see the peace and tranquility of Gethsemane alongside the pain and sorrow of Golgotha. You see the intimate setting where the Jesus and his disciples in the upper room celebrate a tradition of their people. And then the very public and gruesome scene of the Roman tradition of crucifixion. It's these contrasts, seeing the darkness at 3 p.m. as Jesus dies, and then the women at the tomb at dawn as the tomb is empty. It's these contrasts that really stand out to me. And really it's that, that difference between darkness and light. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. But before we go into that, if you could please join me in prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you today and we, we thank you. As we're able to celebrate Easter, as we look back over the past year, it was just a year ago, that so many churches were scrambling as they had to figure out how to do Easter. And so yet here we are able to celebrate together and in person. What, a, what an amazing blessing. Lord, I pray, pray that you bless this time. I thank you for the chance to share your message. I pray that it is your message, that it's about you, that it's from you. I submit myself to you, and I pray that everybody who hears these words, that they would do the same. Be at work in this time, in this place. Let your Holy Spirit speak to each and every one of us. In your name we pray, amen. amen. It was Valentine's Day, 2021, and all of Texas went to bed as this strange precipitation fell outside, whether that be snow or sleet, something that we're not very familiar with. And in my house, at 2 a.m., we were awoken because the fan that we have running at all times, yes, I'm one of those people that has a fan going when it's like 20 degrees outside, it stopped because we had lost power. Well, I thought, oh, that's just one of those rolling blackouts they're talking about. And I rolled over and went back to sleep. Well, I woke up and apparently that blackout was still rolling. <laughs> and it had gotten down, according to the thermostat in our house, to 50 degrees inside. Cold, but manageable. By 10 o'clock, there were already posts on social media that if you have lost power, be ready because you're going to be without it for a while. That night, that Monday night, as we went to bed, the thermostat read 42 degrees inside the house. We used every blanket we had and we were tucked in and again. Around 2 a.m. I woke up this time not because of power failure, but instead because I couldn't feel my hands. <laughs> I got up and blearily went over to the thermostat where it had said 42 prior to us going to bed and now it just said low. <laughs> I'm not a scientist. But where it should say numbers, if it says low, that's not a good thing. And so I made the executive decision we were going to go to the car out in the driveway and be safe about it. Took every blanket. We took our two dogs. I looked at my 13-year-old my little dog shivering as he tried to sleep. We went out to the car and cranked it up and sat there in the heat. And we took shifts sleeping. Because even though we were out in the driveway, it just didn't feel safe to sleep through the night with the car running. So every hour I'd wake up and hey, your turn to go to sleep. I had the last shift. And I'll never forget that feeling 
as the sky suddenly became lighter. And I don't, I say suddenly, it was over time. And seeing that sun come up, it meant that we had made it through the night, because that was in question at times. And that dawn, it struck me in such a powerful way. It was hope creeping up over the horizon. And I was reminded of the ancient people and what they must have thought, when, because for them, dawn brought many of the same thoughts. We made it through another night. Nighttime was a scary time. It was a time of survival, whether that be predators, animals, or raiders coming to get them, or even many cultures believed the spirits were more active at nighttime. And it's not all that different for us these days, right? They still sell night lights for our little ones, right? I know I personally, I don't like sleeping in a completely dark room. And you adults may laugh at the idea, but oh, we have our monsters too when it comes to nighttime. Sure, it's not the monster in the closet, but maybe, maybe it's that stack of bills in the kitchen. Maybe, maybe it's some tough conversation that you know that you have to have. Maybe it's unread emails, you're not sure what's in there and it's just looming over you, or that to-do list, or, or maybe, maybe there is a monster in your closet more in the metaphorical skeletons of sins of the past that you're scared of people finding out about. We all have our monsters that make us afraid of nighttime. Darkness is fear. It's the uncertainty. It's the unknown. You don't know what's around, right? It's the difference. And walking in darkness, you don't know where you're going versus walking in light. We do so confidently. Deep down at some level, all of us are afraid of the dark. It preys upon our deficiencies, our insufficiencies, that question of can I survive, right? That's at our, our very primal core. Can I survive through the night? But then it's also a question of can I survive this life that I have? Am I good enough? That's the question that plagues us at night. And yet it's funny because even as we have this fear of the night, of darkness, it's, it's at night that we're at our most rebellious, right? Anyone who is a teenager can confirm that nothing good happens past midnight. And it's only, I think ironically, because of artificial light, man-made light, that we're able even to have that rebellion. See, we have this hubris. We place ourselves before God. And so we overcome the darkness in our own way, only to rebel all the more. I'm reminded of John 3, not John 3.16, no, a little bit later. John 3.19 and 20, it says this, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people who live in darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But then the sun rises and everything's changed. Hope is restored. The, the monsters that were plaguing on you, they at least go to the back burner and you forget about them. Or the monsters that you thought you saw, the monsters that seemed to loom on you, the monsters that preyed on you, turned out to just be that you hung your bathrobe on the coat rack. And you find that they're all frauds. See, in light, suddenly we can see. When it's light outside, suddenly we have confidence. When it's light, those monsters that were preying upon our fears seem to take a step back. For the ancients, it meant that you had survived another night, that you made it to another day to make yourself better. When the sun rises, hope is restored. We saw in our gospel reading, I'm reminded thinking of, of the followers of Jesus from roughly 3 p.m. on Friday all the way through sunrise on Easter. What must they have thought? What must those few days have been like for them? That Friday night as they went through and witnessed that gruesome affair, seeing the person that they had pinned their hopes on, their, their very identity, their leader, they watched him killed and put into a tomb. They were hopeless. And then Saturday, all day long, what was going through their head? What kind of emotion was plaguing upon them that day? And Saturday night, as they went to bed, had, had it settled in yet? Had the reality of the situation gotten past the shock level? 
And then we get to Sunday morning. And it says, just at daybreak, some women go to the tomb to anoint the body. They weren't going to check and see if the tomb was empty. They were going to take care of the body, to take care of their hopelessness. And what they were concerned about as they went there, they were concerned about who's going to move the rock out of the way. They weren't thinking about resurrection. They were thinking about death. They were consumed with helplessness. We can't even move the stone. We're, we're just trying to do this one thing, and we can't even do that. But then, then, then they get there, and the stone's already gone, and the tomb is empty. Well, it's empty except for, it says, a bright figure, right, that speaks to them who says he is not here. And I wish that I could tell you they heard that and they're like, wow, Jesus is alive. He is risen. He's risen indeed. Hallelujah. Let's go to brunch. That'd be a nice, tidy sermon, wouldn't it? That we have darkness and despair and then the dawn comes and everything's better. But unfortunately, that's not how the story goes. No, it says actually that they left that place. They left that communication with what we assume to be an angel, a messenger of God. They left that place confused, full of despair. See, we'd like to think that that moment where suddenly the Holy Spirit overcomes us and, and we recognize Jesus as our Lord, that, that suddenly our eyes are open and our lives are better. But unfortunately, the Christian life it's not a light switch. It's not a switch on and suddenly you can see and everything's good. No, it's dawn as it slowly creeps across land because the Christian life means you're still gonna have struggle in this world. It's a long and hard process to be more and more like Jesus. It's a long and hard process to, to find that, hey, we're not perfect. And if this is your first time in church and you've had Christians acted like they were perfect to you, they were wrong because we're not. The message of Christianity is that we all, every last one of us walked in through that door as imperfect people. And the reality is we'll walk back out as imperfect people, but we're at least forgiven. We are forgiven of our sin and our imperfection. That is why we celebrate Easter. And it's not a sudden thing, but it takes time. A couple weeks ago, I had the opportunity to take a trip out to the Pacific Northwest, out in that, that Oregon coast into Northern California. We went into a town, and there was a big billboard that said it's the capital of Easter lilies. Okay, so we looked it up, and sure enough, this one town in Northern California raises 90% of the Easter lilies in the world. So these sitting here now probably came from that little town. They're massive fields. Of course, they were all gone when we were there, but... That's where Easter lilies come from. And I think this is such a beautiful symbol of our faith, right? It's a trumpet. It's the angel trumpet proclaiming it. It's God's creation. It's beautiful to look at, great to smell, unless you have allergies. <laughs> we cut out the little pollen things for you guys, all right? Because the allergies here are bad enough. But there's such a beautiful thing. But it struck me. Because while Easter lilies are beautiful to look at on Easter... It only takes a couple days for those beautiful white flowers to turn brown and wilt and fall off, right? Incidentally, in that same town is Jedediah Redwood Forest. In the same town that raises all these Easter lilies and ships off to churches that then beg people afterwards, make sure you take your lilies, is this forest with trees that have been there for 700 years. And the contrast of we use these lilies that last a couple days, at least the flowers, to recognize the resurrection of Jesus, when in actuality, we should be looking at those redwoods and their lasting impact on this planet. See, our faith isn't quick and then wilted. Our faith is meant to be strong and firm. Our faith is to last for eternity. No, the Christian life isn't a light switch. It's a dawn, and it takes some time. I'm reminded of, again, John 3, not John 3, 16, not John 19 and 20 that I just read, but actually the very next verse. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be plainly seen what they have done has been done in the sight of God. That process takes time. That process for the follower of Christ to walk into the light 
Well, that can be frightening as well. But that's why Easter is so important. Because we recognize that we're not perfect. But through Christ, through Good Friday, Jesus pays the price for us. Through Good Friday, we have forgiveness. Through Good Friday, we recognize that we are imperfect, but then made perfect. That's what Good Friday does for us. But then Easter, just a couple days later, it relieves us of the guilt and the shame that we would feel if the story ended on Good Friday, because it could. The story could end on Good Friday and we'd be all good. We would be forgiven of all of our sins because Jesus paid the price, the wage of sin, the cost of sin, the, the, the thing that we rack up because of our sinful lives. The debt is death. But Jesus came, lived perfectly, that we're not living, so that he could then be the sacrifice. Oh, Good Friday could be the end of the story and we would all be forgiven, but we'd have such guilt and shame. And to be clear, there are plenty of churches in this world that would love for that to be the case, to use that guilt to lord it over you and make you, make you pay more and do this. No, 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 no. See, we believe in an empty tomb. We believe in Easter. We believe in that guilt being washed away because Jesus overcame that death. We no longer have to feel guilty about that because we have been redeemed. That's what Easter does. Good Friday forgives us. Easter gives us hope. Easter makes that light pierce through the darkness. And my friends, the reality is this. We live in a dark world. We live in a difficult and painful world. Turn on the news and the, there's stories of, of mass shootings and just as we're coming out of a global pandemic and, and there, there's hatred for people that just because of the way they, they talk or look or act and we, we're hating each other. This is a dark and painful world and so we rely on the light of God to show us the way. We rely on the light that pierces through that darkness, not the ways of the world, but the ways of God because what Jesus taught us in his fairly short three-year ministry, he taught us about love and compassion. That is the way that God desires for us to go. That is the way that's written on every one of our hearts. Call it your conscience, whatever. The Holy Spirit is in you, working and inspiring you. This is the right thing to do. But unfortunately, so often we say, yeah, that might be the right thing to do, but I really want to do that thing instead. But we're forgiven. And it's a process. It is a process to see that light, to live in that light. Through Easter, we are given hope. What Jesus shows us is the impact of that love and compassion. Just a young man, 33 or so years old, a three-year recorded ministry changed the entire world by being loving and showing compassion. And we, as followers of Christ, are called to do the same. I want to close with, with this illustration. I grew up out in the middle of nowhere in Florida, like middle of nowhere. And one of my jobs was to take the trash can and put it out by the street. I say street, it was a dirt road. I'm telling you, middle of nowhere. And I'd have to take it down the driveway that was surrounded by palmettos. And about halfway down, it kind of curved and there was no more artificial light. You couldn't see anything. And on dark nights, like, couldn't see a thing. And it was terrifying for a young man. And so I'd go down there, but there were like two or three days a month where it, was, it wasn't such a bad chore because the moon was shining bright. That full moon was lighting up and I could see that there, there was nothing lurking in the bushes or no spiders across the path or anything like that. And that wasn't such a bad thing. But we know that the moon itself doesn't give off any light. The moon's just a rock, a well-placed rock. But what it does, what it's good at, is reflecting the light of the sun. And that is what we're called to do. That is what we're called to be, not to give off our own light, but instead to just reflect the light of God into this dark world, to, to share love and compassion, to share the light so that others may see. My friends, there are those who need to hear the message of hope. There are those who need to hear that God loves them. You need to hear God loves you. He knows about all the things that you're afraid of at night. 
And he still loves you. And he loves you so much that he was willing to be the sacrifice, to live the perfect life, and then die the sacrificial death so that you can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are forgiven. My friends, my brothers and sisters in Christ, dawn has come, and Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Will you pray with me? Lord God, Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you today realizing that we live in a world full of darkness, full of pain, full of sorrow and confusion and sorrow, and so we know that we, we draw ever on towards your light, but it's a process. And so we pray for that light to dawn upon us, to, for our eyes to be open, to know that there is light reaching out to us in the darkness. Remind us, Lord, of your love for each and every person on this planet, for everyone who has been and who will be. You love us all. Help us, Lord, to do the same. Help us to share your love. Help us to be love in this world, to live lives that share love. Inspire us this Easter to reflect your light into the darkness. And Lord, because we live in this broken world, there are so many who are feeling the effects of it that, that are, have been dealing with the past year with, with the pandemic, those who are serving on the front lines, those who have seen fractures in their families, those who have seen pain, who have seen sickness, who have been distanced because of, of hospitals and all of those things. Lord, we pray that your will is done in this world. We thank you, Lord, for those who are working so hard to reunite us to bring us back together. Lord, we pray that your light wins over the darkness, that your love extinguishes the hate that is in so many hearts. Remind us, Lord, of who you are and what you have done for us. Help us to reflect that so that others may see, so that others may know that there is hope. We pray all these things through your son Jesus. In his name, amen. We're gonna now together, because the reality is, I know that, that you all have things going on in your lives, whether it be those watching online or here in this room, it'd be impossible for me to pray all the requests that, that have, God has given you, all the things that this world has thrown at you. But when Jesus was walking on this earth, he taught us a prayer that says it all. He saw as people celebrated, as people mourned. He saw as people laughed and they cried. He said, listen, here is a prayer that speaks it all. And so here now in this place, alongside millions of other Christ followers in this world, alongside so many who have gone before us, alongside our Lord himself, we pray that very same prayer now, praying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, this would be the time that we would pass the offering plate around. Obviously, we can't do that because of current circumstances. Um, but for those of you who are regular church members, you know that this is a statement of trust in God for the blessings that he has given you and a trust that he will continue to bless you. But I wanna say, those of you who are guests, don't be like, oh, this is the part where they ask for money. No, um, in fact, we give you the opportunity to receive. Uh, as you exit out the back of the doors at the end of the service, there is a table that says welcome on it with some black bags on there. That is our gift to you as first time guests. Uh, feel free to grab those and I'd love to meet you. I'd love to chat with you. Um, so I'd encourage you to do that again. Fill out that yellow card if you're a guest, white card if you're a member. Those of you joining online, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we're gonna continue in worship now with the sacrament of the altar, which really can only be only be celebrated in person. Uh, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna sing the doxology all together and then the feed will, will end. I pray that you guys have a great week, that you have a blessed Easter and that you know that Christ is risen. He is risen indeed, alleluia. Let's sing together the doxology. Amen.